on behalf of all peace-loving people. It's a grand, a great initiative, the likes of which has not been seen in recent years, and the, the implications of which will live with us for a long time and might indeed assist us as we interrogate this subject, which has now captured the imagination of the entire world. Thousands, just last week in London alone, 400,000 demonstrators. The, every part of the, of the world has been a massive reaction. And it's clear that what we want to see out of this is first and foremost, the end of the genocide. And in due course, the end of the occupation and the resolution of the Palestinian question. So without much ado, I call on Professor Stephen Friedman to introduce the topic. And after him, really. Stephen. Thanks, Ivo. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for the opportunity to engage with all of you. Um, yeah, <clears throat> as, as, as Ibo has pointed out, I've, I've just published uh, my book on Jewish identity and uh, the Israeli state. And the book doesn't directly answer the question uh, that uh, has been put in this particular discussion, how do we stop the genocide and how do we stop the occupation? Um, but I think that it, uh, <clears throat> it provides some sort of platform uh, for, for looking at, at, at how those goals may be achieved. <clears throat> Sadly, uh, and this might seem odd in the current context, uh, I think that it's far easier to spell out a process which would end the occupation uh, than a process which would end the current genocide, because uh, I think that processes have been set in motion which will take a long time to, uh, to, to, to have an effect. Um, but uh, hopefully it might spread some light on, 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 on what might stop the genocide as well. And I think that the way in which uh, I want to do that is to um, just outline very briefly uh, some key points from the book, which I think are, are relevant to, uh, uh, to, to what we see in front of us today. Uh, the book is incidentally uh, an attempt to explain why it is uh, that, uh, first of all, uh, that people who uh, oppose actions like the ones that we've been seeing over the last five months uh, are repeatedly uh, demonized as anti-Semites, as anti-Jewish racists. Uh, and a similar anomaly, a similar strange feature, which is that uh, you very often find in today's world that uh, politicians and uh, uh, political forces, which are clearly are <clears throat> uh, anti-Semitic in the sense that they harbor racist attitudes towards Jews, uh, that they are very close friends uh, of, of the Israeli state. Um, and, and this was illustrated in a sense by the incident with which I begin the book, uh, this bizarre aspect of the demonstrations in the United States in support of Donald Trump in uh, January, January the 6th of 2021, the attempted insurrection in which participants were both wearing uh, t-shirts which cheered on the Nazis, t-shirts which had slogans like six million were not enough, and were also carrying Israeli flags. Uh, <clears throat> And the way in which uh, I explain this in a nutshell, I, I should say, incidentally, you know, given uh, that this is a great, you know, that uh, we're, we're talking among a group of people whose interests go well beyond Palestine, uh, that the book does argue that some of the uh, realities that I criticize in the book are not exclusive to this particular issue. So there is a, a much wider phenomenon of uh, anti-racists being uh, accused of racism. Uh, and in fact, I argue in the book that <clears throat> in a sense, I mean, that's a bit of a crudification, but it, it illustrates part of it, 
uh, that racists, in effect, since changed their tactics about 50 years ago. <clears throat> and instead of doing what they used to do, which was simply proclaiming white superiority and white supremacy, uh, they now mobilize anti-racist language uh, in order to justify racist acts and policies. Uh, so that, for example, black people who complain uh, about inequality are, are accused of racism or accused of anti-white racism. Uh, the, the South African phrase, which I think appears in some other places too, uh, playing the race card when, when, when everybody says race is a question of racial inequality. But the specific case we're dealing with and the case which uh, uh, sadly explains what is happening to people in Gaza today, um, I think needs to be understood by looking, as I try to do in the book, by going back to some of the sources uh, of the writing and the political thinking uh, which produced the, the Israeli state. And arguing against a common view, uh, which is often shared not only by supporters of the Israeli state, but also by their opponents, uh, that uh, the Israeli state is an exercise in Jewish self-assertion. In other words, Jews who support the Israeli state are people who are particularly uh, proud of their ethnicity, particularly proud of their ethnic origins, uh, and who uh, want to, to, to express their, their Jewishness in that way. Uh, the reality is rather different. If you go back to the original Zionist writers, the people whose writing created the state of Israel in a sense, uh, they didn't like Jews very much. Uh, they had very unflattering things to say about Jews. Uh, and in fact, many of the things that they had to say about Jews were no different to the kind of things which clearly committed anti-Jewish racists say about Jews. The difference was that uh, the, the, the committed anti-Jewish racists insisted that all this was genetic, that uh, Jews were uh, born in a particular way and, and therefore doomed to be a problem. Uh, whereas the Zionist people like uh, Herzl in, 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 uh, in, in, in Europe uh, said, no, 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 the problem is that Jews don't have a state. Uh, and if Jews had a state, then Jews would uh, earn the respect uh, of, of white Europeans. Uh, and that, in a sense, is, in, in a nutshell, uh, is what Zionism is about. Um, so Herzl uh, writes, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, Herzl wrote a novel called Alt Neuland, uh, Old New Land, in which he, he, he set out uh, what he thought his state, uh, his Jewish state in the, in the Levant would look like. Uh, and the interesting feature of this, uh, this Jewish state is that its, uh, its, its uh, citizens uh, enjoy each evening dressing up in top hat and tails and going to the opera. They speak German. And according, according to Herzl, they would engage in dueling, which was very common among the European upper classes at the time, because dueling create dueling brings some French refinement uh, to, to this basic German, German speaking colony. So, in other words, in a nutshell, what Herzl and, 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 and many of his fellow Zionists uh, envisaged uh, was uh, a, a European state in the Levant. Uh, and they believed that if there was a European state, a, a Jewish European state in the Levant, uh, then Jews would be accepted by white European society. Uh, it's very important, I don't go into this in the book, but uh, you know, it's, it's something which has been pointed out to me since then, which I perhaps should have gone into in the book. Uh, of course, Jews don't only come from Europe. Uh, they're you know, always, I mean, originally Jews didn't come from Europe at all. Uh, but even, uh, you know, in the last couple of millennia, there have been Jews in the Orient, Jews in the Middle East, so, yeah. and the point that needs to be made is that there is no, the, 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 the ideology of Zionism, which came to underpin the Israeli state, has no adherence, had no adherence at, initially among Jews in, uh, in, in the area in which the Israeli state is now, so there was no 
uh, Iraqi Zionist movement. There was no Syrian Zionist movement, etc. Uh, and I think that's that that underlines the point that I'm I'm making. So this really uh, what we are dealing with in the Middle East uh, is not an expression of Jewishness. It's an expression of white Europeanness. And that, of course, explains why uh, the Israeli state gets on so splendidly with Donald Trump, with the Viktor Orban in Hungary, with Jair Bolsonaro when he was running Brazil. Uh, because they're all European supremacists, uh, or to put it bluntly, white supremacists. Uh, and therefore, the fact uh, that uh, the people who run the Israeli state happen to be Jewish uh, is, is something which is not a problem uh, for the white right, uh, because they are, after all, now Europeans. Now, that has a particular consequence. Uh, it has many consequences, but it has a particular consequence, which I think does a great deal Hey, Stephen, Stephen, are you there? You glitched there. Sorry, can Stephen. You can you yes, hear me now? Yes. Sorry, it's just that, I just that, load, that load, load shedding, maybe. <laughs> no, 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 it's not load shedding. As I said, there seems to be a cable problem. Uh, people have been battling with the internet all day. Um, it seemed to be, I, it's it's really, it's about a cable under the sea, apparently. It's it's the whole of Gauteng. So hopefully we'll be spared again. It, there's, uh, there's no load shedding here at all. So um, hopefully it won't happen again. Uh, should I just continue? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was talking about Mamdani and I was talking about... Uh, a good Muslim, bad Muslim. And uh, there are some very interesting parallels between our arguments. But one of Mamdani's observations, I think, describes uh, the genocide uh, to a T. Uh, and he makes the argument uh, that in the minds of the elites of Europe, uh, there are two types of wars. Uh, there are the colonizers' wars, uh, and there are the wars on the colonized. Uh, and among the colonizer, Mamdani argues, the laws of war apply. So in other words, when Europeans fight Europeans, uh, the, the Geneva Conventions, the protection of civilians, of hospitals, of schools, etc., apply. Uh, but when Europeans uh, conquer or, or fight uh, people who are uh, from other parts of the world, uh, those laws do not apply. What applies, he says, is the laws of nature, which is really might is right. And of course, there's there's a lot of historical evidence to support this, and a lot of contemporary evidence to support it. And the historical evidence, which will be familiar, I'm sure, to some people in this discussion, uh, is that he made the point that uh, while the, while Europe was justifiably horrified by the Nazi genocide. Uh, it didn't seem to terribly much mind the genocide against the Herero and Nama people of Namibia, uh, which Brother Glitch, Brother Glitch, Stephen. Hey, Stephen. Stephen. Yeah, this is entirely outside my control, I'm afraid. I, no, I just, no, just kind of no problem. You have to live with it. Live with it. Right. So, of course, you know, there's the contrast between the the, the, the Namibian and Herrera genocide and, 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 and the Nazi genocide in Europe. Uh, of course, latterly, we know that 
uh, it is not permitted to treat Ukrainians in the same way as you treat Palestinians. Uh, another example, because Ukrainians are, of course, white Europeans. Uh, and of course, latterly, um, what uh, is rightly seen as the right of Jewish Israelis and not to be subject to war crimes doesn't apply to Palestinians. You can do what you like to Palestinians. Uh, and that is the reality that, that we're seeing at the moment. And, and obviously the question then becomes, well, what has that reality got to do with the question of this, of, of this dialogue, uh, which is how do we stop this happening? Um, and I think that there is a connection between something else that I've written on this conflict uh, a while ago and the book. And the other thing that I've written on the conflict is an article which uh, appeared in a, in a site called Africa is a Country, uh, in which I argue that uh, the events of October the 7th and subsequently uh, may well be the Israeli state's sharp fall. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the sharp fall murders of uh, protesters in, the, in 1960 in South Africa, in which uh, unarmed people uh, protesting against uh, the past laws were shot by police. Uh, and Sharpville turned out to be a watershed moment in the fight against apartheid. Because there's a lot of romanticism about uh, the fight against South, about, about international attitudes to apartheid. Uh, and it's assumed, for example, that because Western countries were opposed to apartheid in the last few years of the system, that they were always opposed to apartheid. Uh, and that is not true. They certainly were not actively opposed to it. The year after Sharpeville, uh, the, the British allowed South Africa to become a republic, despite the fact that the referendum which endorsed a republic was voted that only white people were allowed to vote in the referendum. Uh, and despite the fact that the British knew perfectly well that the republic that they were allowed to happen, uh, would, uh, would, would dominate and oppress black people. But what Sharpeville did do is that it began to galvanize citizens. Uh, and it became a, a means of sensitizing people, if you like, uh, to what it was that was being done to people in South Africa. And, and, and the sort of images of Sharpful became rallying cries for the citizens' movement uh, against South African apartheid. Uh, around the world, but including, of course, in the West and in, 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 in Europe and in the United States. Um, and, and just as one among many illustrations of Sharpeville's abiding influence, um, one of the best known posters, uh, European anti-apartheid posters, uh, which was created in, in, in Britain to protest against the arrival of a South African cricket team, uh, was a picture of a police officer brutalizing a black person. Uh, and the caption was, if you could see their national sport, you wouldn't want to see their cricket. Uh, and of course, I mentioned that simply as an example of, of the power of those sharpful images to galvanize people. So, so what I'm suggesting is that the, 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 the violence we're seeing at the moment uh, is beginning to galvanize opinion and is beginning to seep into almost the daily practices uh, of, of people in a variety of countries, including Western countries. Uh, so that it is no longer only uh, small groups of people with a particular interest who are taking notice of Palestine. Uh, anybody who uh, is concerned about racial domination uh, and about uh, uh, violence uh, directed against people simply because of who they are, uh, is becoming galvanized by this issue. And, and, and there are countless examples. I mean, Ibo mentioned these huge marches, which are significant. Uh, but uh, it, 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 it makes itself felt in all sorts of ways. You have you know, somebody making a speech at the Oscars, a producer making a speech at the Oscars, uh, denouncing uh, the genocide. You have people resigning uh, as arts editor of the New York Times because of that or that, that publication's failure uh, to recognize what is being done to Palestine. Uh, and I think that this is going to grow. 
uh, I, I think that it will continue to grow. Now, of course, you could, if, you, if you're a skeptic, which you're obviously entitled to be, you could say, well, there have been times in the past where Palestine was a popular issue, but, but I don't think that it's on anything like the scale that we're beginning to see at the moment. And if you get back to my point about Westernness and the, the crucial aspect of Westernness uh, in the support for the Israeli state, uh, I think that as to this, this uh, post <coughs> the Israeli Sharpeville tide starts to swell, uh, <coughs> Westernness is going to be very important because for a variety of reasons, uh, there is a significant strategic difference uh, between the situation of Palestinians and the sit situation that black people found themselves in the uh, And there is one particular difference between those situations which has huge implications. Uh, and that is that, the, that unlike white South Africa, the Israeli state and its citizens are not dependent on Palestinian labor. And because they're not dependent on Palestinian labor, the bargaining power, uh, which people have when their labor is dependent on, uh, is, uh, is, is, is uh, eroded in the Palestinian case. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to underestimate many of the horrors of apartheid in South Africa because there were many, uh, but uh, the kind of random killing that we've seen over the last five months, uh, was never tried in South Africa, probably <coughs> if one wants to be cynical for the very simple reason that if it was tried, if what was tried, a whole lot of uh, households and industries uh, and, and commercial establishments wouldn't have had the labor they needed to, to continue. Uh, and that's not a, a plus which the Palestinian people have. And because that is the case, <coughs> I think it's reasonable to expect that the battle a, to prevent the kind of horrors that we've been seeing over the last while or so, and B, the battle to end the occupation, is going to be fought far more in the international arena um, <coughs> than in the South African case, which doesn't mean it wasn't fought in the international arena in the South African case, of course it was. Uh, but I think the relative, uh, you know, the relative, the, the international pressure in South Africa, I would argue, would not have achieved anything if there wasn't effective internal resistance. Uh, uh, that's not quite the same case, in, uh, the same as Palestine. So the Palestinian reality is uh, that international uh, pressure will be, will be important. And, and although Western governments are continuing to rally around the state which is perpetrating the genocide, uh, they are, as I indicated earlier, simply behaving the way in which Western governments behaved on Sharpville. Uh, it is entirely conceivable over the next few years that they will be forced to change some of their policies and some of their approaches by organized citizens. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, what we need to look to uh, to get a sense of, of, of where this might go. And if that is indeed the case, uh, the battle about Westernness is going to become very important. Because the interesting point, I've been talking about Westernness in a very sort of broad sense, uh, but it's, it's more complicated than that. And it's more complicated than that because the Westernness that I talk about is really the preserve the elites. Uh, in its sense, it's the political elites, it's the, the media, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the organizations which wield power in society tend to, to have this uh, continual supremacist colonial outlook. Uh, it is not necessarily shared by citizens. Of course, it is shared by some citizens, but as we're seeing on the streets of many cities, it's not shared by, by hundreds of thousands of citizens, and I, I, I expect those ranks to grow. I think one very interesting aspect of this, which, which gets back to the themes of my book, is that I think the prospect of encouraging, successfully encouraging Jewish opposition to what the Israeli state is doing is greater in this case, significantly greater in this case 
than it was in the South African case. And, and the reason for that is that, uh, you know, talking to white, trying to convince white South Africans that they shouldn't oppress black people uh, was never going to be a particularly productive thing to do. Uh, I think that trying to convince most Jewish Israelis that they ought to stop uh, doing what they're doing to Palestinian people is, is equally futile. Uh, but remember uh, that a significant section of the Jewish community is based precisely in those Western countries uh, which provide the Israeli state with the support which enables it to do what it's doing. Uh, and if, as the opinion polls are telling us, is beginning to happen, uh, if Jews in these countries are increasingly questioning uh, what the Israeli state does and how it does, uh, then that could be a very significant factor, political factor going forward. And I think that there's every prospect that that might happen. And, and, the, and the reason I think that there's every prospect that might happen is that, of course, there's a crucial difference between you know, Jewish Americans or, or Jewish uh, British people or European people on the one hand, uh, and Israeli Jews and white South Africans on the other hand, and that is that uh, British American Jews, et cetera, uh, are not, do not have the same sort of stake uh, in domination uh, as, as, as the people on the ground. So in other words, the, the point I'm making can be very simply expressed by the fact that uh, the living standards and, and, and way of life of a Jewish person living in New York or Paris is not will not fundamentally change uh, if the occupation is, uh, but the lives of Jewish Israelis will change. But if I'm correct in saying that the battle is going to be fought on the international stage, uh, then this becomes hugely significant. Uh, and if that is right, then the themes of the book uh, become absolutely crucial because uh, what the book, of course, is trying to do uh, is to criticize a particular notion. Uh, of what it is to be Western uh, and to suggest that the idea in, in effect uh, that democracy, liberty, etc., uh, are, are, are monopolies of the West is, is untrue, uh, that very often they are, they're, they're, they are most actively violated by the West. Uh, and uh, those kinds of, of arguments, uh, I think, become crucial uh, if what we're trying to do uh, is to persuade people uh, that, uh, which is also one of the themes of the book, uh, that the identity of Jewish people uh, does not depend uh, on having a state which oppresses Palestinians. So I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, sorry about the technological problems that hopefully <laughs> they've left us alone for a while. It wasn't as bad as that. At all. Sorry? It wasn't as bad as, as, as bad as we thought it might be. So <laughs> I think you got through your 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 theme very 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 well. And, uh, and I just I just thought maybe uh, before I hand hand over to to uh, Willie uh, tying your theme the theme of your book, uh, which I think. It, it, weaves in very neatly into the very origins of the Israeli state. Um, one cannot imagine that happening without a large dose of supremacist, racist ideology. And uh, those of us who are historians will remember that the, the, the attempts to establish the Israeli state in Uganda and the powerful agreement, remember. Right. But really, that the, 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 the uh, Africans and people who were lesser, lesser humans than the Europeans were, were regarded as dispensable in the establishment of, of the Israeli state. And as it turned out, of course, the Palestinian question is really precisely the origins of the Israeli state itself, 1948. And, and I just thought, uh, if we agree, as I, I tend to agree, that the extent to which the the, the situation in, uh, in in Middle East, in Palestine, 
in Gaza in particular, has become very internationalized. Is it possible, Stephen, to use the context within which his real estate was established in 1948 as a starting point uh, in interrogating? I think that we cannot sufficiently interrogate uh, the, the disaster that's happening in that part of the world without looking at the origins of the problem in the first instance and how this really was part of the colonial question, if, if one may put it, or if one wants to be kinder, is it kind in the context of double standards? Hmm? One standard for the colonizers, another st standard for the colonized. How do we begin unraveling the, the origins of the Israeli state? People tend to forget that, right? that that is where the problem began, so to speak. Or even put more bluntly, that the Jewish question, is, as which, 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 which is the major uh, motivation behind the, the formation of the Israeli state, was largely a European question uh, in, the, in, the, in the sense or in the extent to which uh, people of Jewish origin were murdered uh, uh, in the Holocaust, you know, and that therefore the kind of uh, conscience salvaging was part of the process that brings about the Israeli state. Can you comment on that, Steve? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that the origins of the state become absolutely crucial because there's a great deal of mythology about this and a great deal of romanticism about this. Uh, and, and it was a fundamentally colonial enterprise. But I, I think that I mean, so, you know, one of the entry points is uh, that, I mean, one of the, 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 the quaint features of today's Europe um, is that, you know, anti-Semitism, which of course is a very bad term because it, it, it in fact, it's a very ironic term because it was actually invented by racists. It's invented by anti-Jewish racists um, or, or anti-Jewish racism to, to give it its correct title. Um, accusations of anti-Semitism have really become a code for accusations of anti-Westernism. And your point about the origins is crucial because what I argue in the book, and, and we're obviously in agreement on this, is that this is not some latter-day invention. And the entire invent, you know, the entire creation of the state uh, was an attempt to 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 westernize that part of the world, to 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 impose a, a Western stamp on that part of the world, and that part of that was actually an attempt to remake what it was to be Jewish, and and that to me is interesting, not simply you know, because I think that Jews are the only people one should appeal to, far from it. Uh, but because there is, is so much mendacity about, you know, the attempt to portray critiques of the Israeli state as anti-Semitic, as anti uh, that the anti-Semitic strains in Zionism are ignored. Uh, I mean, there's a strong anti-Semitic strain in Zionism, um, which, which I've talked about earlier. Uh, and so this idea that you can only be proud of your Jewishness if you happen to be a Zionist is, 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 is false. And I think that making those arguments not only appeals uh, to Jews, but I think also begins to challenge some of the elites in Europe and the US um, who are in effect, and that's why my book talks about the assault on meaning, who are taking a word which was supposed to mean anti-racism and turning it into a tool of their own racism. Uh, so I think that uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to make the point that what we're seeing, what you're describing, is, is not something which happened in the last few years because you have a couple of people in the Israeli government who call themselves fascist. Uh, it's something which has been there since, since this whole enterprise started. It's, it's been a core element in the whole enterprise, yes. Thanks, Stephen. Will you return to you now? In addition to what you have to say and prepared to say, can you also yeah. consider we can yeah. begin more or less, um, uh, what the likely trajectory of the advocacy around the current genocide in, 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 in uh, Palestine and the possibility of escalating it to a process 
we wish the occupation could be ended. Welcome, Willie. Like also before Willie starts to welcome other 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 persons on this platform, and in, in particular Larry Gaba, whom I hope will have something to say. Larry Gaba from the U.S., uh, Anne Torstensen from uh, Norway. Uh, Michelle Bassa from London, Owen Chone from Zambia, and Tommy Stole from Harare. Uh, Willie, Karibu. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ibo. Um, <clears throat> I, I'll just uh, keep my, you know, my camera off because uh, I might go, I might have the same problem that uh, Stephen had uh, a while back. But I want to start by <clears throat> saying that uh, uh, I've learned a lot from what uh, uh, Stephen described as the, you know, the root causes of, you know, of the issue we, we, we are talking about. Uh, uh, and I think that's important. It's very important if you, if, if we are going to talk about uh, uh, stopping genocide and uh, stopping the occupation. The root causes are always very, very, very important. And I think the other point that uh, he raised, which also relates to the question that you have asked me to talk about, about advocacy. He, he, when he talks about galvanizing, you know, uh, global support, you know, that is, is, is growing. Um, I agree with him because I think there's a growing global uh, consciousness about uh, humanity on the planet. And we saw this with the, the case of uh, Black Lives Matter when George Floyd was uh, killed. And if you tracked the demonstrations, you know, as we are doing now, the demonstrations against uh, uh, this genocide, uh, you could basically see uh, the entire world, uh, you know, standing up for uh, humanity and a different, different planet that is uh, sp peaceful and non-militaristic, that is, uh, you know, non-racist. Uh, and I see, I see that, uh, you know, uh, you know that 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 growing. And in the case of 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 Africa, of course, in terms of advocacy, uh, th there's been a lot of uh, organizing in my own country. You have, uh, uh, you know, two organizations that support uh, the the Palestinian uh, cause, and uh, of course, just like in South Africa, Kenya. Uh, internalizes this this particular issue. Uh, you know, we were occupied, we were colonized, colonized, we were brutalized, uh, and we didn't have any rights. The colonial apartheid system was similar to the South African one, and uh, the whole racism, you know, as well. So, so, so for me, uh, what I've been raising, particularly in, in, in the case of Kenya, and that's my involvement, uh, as, 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 uh, has been based on that history and the fact that, uh, you know, we have a, a constitution that uh, uh, basically says that we have to be consulted uh, when the president supports Israel without any any public uh, participation. Uh, and the this has been, you know, going on and people, basically we are saying that uh, our president can't speak, you know, uh, in our name when uh, he takes positions uh, that we haven't, you know, participated in. And, and, and so there's, there's also, you know, uh, that aspect that has, we have also to track of, uh, you know, uh, what you might call, you know, global 
solidarity, what you might call a, a global consciousness between the citizens of the South and North in identifying the root cause of uh, a planet that uh, we want changed uh, and the world status, status quo is not sustainable and is not uh, acceptable. In, in, in the case of, of Kenya that I can speak about, is there, there is that our own history, but there is this, uh, you know, uh, anger, you know, that, you know, our elite basically takes orders, you know, from uh, the global elites that, you know, support uh, uh, Israel. And that anger is, is obviously a subject to governization, which will be, a, you know, a great thing if, if uh, you know, the global south and north, the, the citizens uh, can have that glo uh, global uh, consciousness about the kind of planet they want, you know, and they will obviously say they want a planet that is uh, free and just, planet that is uh, peaceful and non-militaristic, a planet that uh, is ecologically safe, you know, non-homophobic, etc. And uh, I, 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 I think that issue, when it comes to uh, mobilization and advocacy for a new plan planet, is it's it's an important thing to to take into account because these global solidarities are growing and they are growing because of particular uh, violent and racist. Uh, issues and issues of domination, exploitation, and uh, and uh, you know oppression. So as I said, yes, Steve, is, is, I learned a lot from Steve on on the basis of the origins. Uh, there, are, there are many parallels that you know can be taken uh, for this uh, you know uh, particular uh, struggle. Uh, you know, going forward. And uh, I also think it's when he talks of, you know, the, the role that the international arena is going to play and the notion of organized citizens, I think that's that's what I'm talking about, this uh, the global consciousness uh, uh, by the citizens of the North and South about uh, humanity on the uh, you know, on the, on the planet. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's, that's, that's will be my, uh, comments, both, you know, for the time being. And, uh, I also thank you for, uh, playing Franklin Bokaka, you know, <laughs> as, as, as we started, because it's, uh, I think is is one of our great artists, uh, and um, you know, and a revolutionary who was killed at the age of thirty-two. That's interesting. Can you send me a note on that uh, sometime? And also, we have had a problem trying to identify him and uh, and pay not only tribute but some kind of uh, uh, this token royalties, if they if possible, maybe. And advise us in due course. But before uh, I turn to the to the floor, one of the things which I've seen uh, both uh, with, uh, with, with reference uh, both to what you just said about Kenya and uh, the role of the of uh, the Kenyan government in its relationship with with, uh, with Israel. One one uh, I remember maybe you making the same remarks as some of us have. The, the deafening silence on the part of most of Africa, including the AU, as South Africa went to the ICJ. In fact, only one African country, uh, Namibia, has stood up to be counted. Not even a statement from my own country, Zimbabwe, right next door. Are you able to comment on the reasons that account for that deafening silence 
uh, almost complicit silence on the part of Africa and the African states in particular. Yeah, I I think I think it's it's the the leadership you know in Africa uh, at the moment you know who 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 is there to stand for us the way Nkrumah did uh, Gaddafi Sankara uh, Amika Cabral uh, you know Nyerere and or Lumumba they quite a number but I I don't. Uh, I I don't see that you know um, kind of, of of leadership. So Africa has a a crisis of political leadership, and it's see it's very clear to me that uh, the African political leadership was is enslaved by you know these forces, okay, you know um, uh, foreign po- forces. <clears throat> that basically, you know, uh, give orders. And these uh, foreign interests don't respect, you know, our constitution. They pontificate about democracy and the rule of law, you know, but that's about it. It's, uh, what you see is just sheer perfidy, double standards, you know, uh, you know, racism. Uh, but it's clear um, that if you take the example of Kenya, you know, the position the president has taken on IET, the position he's taken on on trade agreements with the US and the, you know, Europe, and the position he's taken on Palestine, it's, 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 it's a dictatorial position. And I'm sure a lot of the African countries uh, uh, leaders, African leaders, are taking those positions because of that, you know that that uh, reality, and it's 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 a positive thing in terms of the uh, the consciousness I was talking about, uh, because we want uh, and we've done this with uh, people in Haiti and uh, in, you know in, in Palestine. We, we made it very clear in our advocacy that what the government says is not said in our voice. In a, in a, uh, they are not speaking uh, the people's voice here uh, and, and they're giving reasons uh, for this. And even, I guess you know, uh, it was really shameful. Uh, a country like Kenya not to basically support the South African effort. I thought the the settler colonies particularly, you know, Kenya, um, Zag, Zimbabwe, and Kenya and Zimbabwe, you know, would support uh, that noble cause. Uh, but anyway, I think as intellectuals, we have also spoken, we've supported, you know, uh, South Africa, and I think that's uh, that's, what should happen, you know, people to people solidarities. We're not going to uh, rely on our leadership to to really take patriotic positions and support uh, the the liberation or the the change of this particular planet. That's as I said, is is uh, and needs to be changed. Yes, it was most commendable the, for that letter that uh, the intellect, African intellectuals sent to South Africa to commend them for the initiative on the ICJ. That cannot be forgotten as because in the record, and I think South Africa appreciates that as, as and it does. I've been asked, I've been asked to, to actually take that letter to, uh, to the AU. I don't know where to start. I don't know whether they will allow me to present it, but uh, that's what we intend intend to do. It's, it's basically a shaming exercise as far as I'm concerned. No, no I think it's all in order and we'll support that fully. But one, yeah. uh, another question, which is a double-edged uh, uh, question. Mm. One is, uh, the what is the nature of the structural relationships between 
the Israeli state and some of the African states, or most of the African states, that you are aware of. And secondly, what is it that uh, is the Israeli state wants in Africa that you can go as far as seeking as formal observer status at the AU? What's your understanding of this long relationship between? Well, uh, Israel, uh, Zionist Israel is a, is a frontier state, you know, for the interests that uh, uh, Steve, you know, explained. So for me, uh, you know, all these relationships, okay, all these relationships reflect, you know, those 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 uh, uh, interests, those foreign interests, uh, and of course, uh, the they. I'm not saying they're just doing that for the, you know, for the Americans and the Europeans and uh, Western whiteness. Uh, although that's a, a compelling argument, but uh, frontier states are, are, are basically colonies of certain interests, there, obviously, and uh, and 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 so uh, going to Africa. You know, uh, you know, a country now that is it's 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 actually my position is that we as Africans we don't own Africa, and that's uh, that's 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 the position. So so I I I I think the the role that uh, uh, Israel is playing. It's, uh, you know, getting those observer status at the AU, uh, they can get anything from uh, you know African leaders. The African leaders are themselves taking instructions for you know from their masters. So there is there, there, there is a relationship there, uh, which which is reflected, uh, you know, in uh, uh, what AU obviously. Uh, did and in what we Africans we have to do is to 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 also now you know uh, focus on AU. You yes. know the states uh, before the states uh, took over there was people to people Pan Africanism. Mm. You know in the, in, the, in 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 the in Africa and uh, the the Congress in 1958 is a clear example of that. You know, before the states then came in, and uh, so we have to start all over. You know, and I think there are many uh, solidarities uh, taking place in Africa. You know, among the youth and uh, other people, women, uh, and, and I think that's that that is comforting. Oh. Asante, Willy, Asante, Sana. We'll come back to your question time. Uh, in the meantime, I see some hands up already. Uh, Tony Rila, uh, Larry Gaba, uh, who else? Okay. Tony. Okay, thank thank you both to, to Willie and Stephen. I've got two comments <coughs> that are also simultaneously questions. The first is, Stephen, thank you very much for pointing out that history is really critical to understanding this problem. Uh, and I think one of the problems about history is history is so often myth. And, and in trying to understand what's going on, <clears throat> uh, I'm struck by going back to 1948 and the Nakba and uh, listening and, and reading and discovering that one of the great myths was that... Uh, Israel, or the Israeli state in 1948, was immediately assaulted by the Arab nations. Uh, and what I've learned is that actually the Arab nations responded to exactly a similar situation to Gaza, is that people were being attacked in their villages and they were driven out uh, with 
with significant deaths and significant violence, um, not on the scale of what's happening in Gaza, but nonetheless, this was a violent occupation to which the Arab nations responded. They haven't responded this time because, as you point out, the world is a very different place. So one of the things that I'm struck by is that the mythology of a embryonic state being immediately attacked on what is accepted as uh, uh, ethnic grounds and it feeds into your notion of uh, Western support and how Western countries view two different kinds of war is very important both then and 75 or 76 years later. That's the first, first point and comment. I'm big, interested in your comments on that. The second one is something that myself and many of us in the human rights movement concerned with transitional justice have been discussing, and that was the decision to call this genocide. Now, I'm not going to argue about whether it is or isn't genocide. That's going to be in front of the courts. But some of us felt that a different tack might have been to make the call for crimes against humanity. And I make this point because the burden of proof in these two crimes is enormously different. Uh, in genocide, you must prove intent. Whereas in crimes against humanity, what you have is a lower duty of care, is that you just did not care and you were happy to commit crimes of murder, extrajudicial uh, executions, displacement, rape, etc., etc. So it seems to me that taking the high-profile uh, decision on genocide, which may or may not be proved, uh, immediately uh, polarized the discussion in a way that was not helpful for some of the points that you have just made about international solidarity. And I go back to your Sharpeville argument, because in Sharpeville, everybody was clear that whatever you felt and whether you knew about the crimes against humanity or genocide, it was quite clear. These were crimes against humanity, and it was very clear that crimes against humanity followed subsequently. And that built the solidarity. So the minor point I'm making is genocide versus crimes against humanity and the prospect for much better international solidarity on stopping the consequence to the victims, because the consequence to the victims is exactly the same, whether it's genocide or crimes against humanity. Thank you, and thank you to both of you. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Yeah, I think the last sentence uh, uh, refers, I mean, wasn't, wasn't the, the concept of genocide uh, derived from crimes against humanity. Maybe I'll give that to the panelists to answer. Um, anyone else? Larry Gaba, you like to come in? Andy Tone, who's the Andy Tone? Andy Tone. Andy Tone is shown up. Uh, Hello, Let's can, you, can, can you hear Hello? me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yes. Can Go you ahead. hear me? I can hear yes. you. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the issue of um. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the issue of uh, okay. the lack of because um, we have to look at the current status of the understanding of the youth because if you go back to share view people were asleep. Hello? I can hear you, but you are very broken. Yeah, it's difficult to follow because there's a, it's garbled. There's something wrong with the line. <clears throat> oh, 
Okay. Uh, who's coming in now? Uh, Larry? Um, okay. I really wasn't planning on speaking. I was uh, more looking at this as an opportunity to hear uh, some of the voices. Uh, and uh, after, I have, after I say what I say, you may not want it, want it uh, to have me speak. So, uh, But I will make two comments. So first of all, on the issue of um, um, you know what's going on now, I don't think there's any doubt that you know we, we should be calling for a ceasefire, uh, stop the, the the killing that that is happening uh, in Gaza, providing the humanitarian aid that aid that's necessary, releasing the hostages. Um, all those are are things that you know I support, and I assume everyone else supports. Um, the, the, the thing that, you know, looks, uh, strange to me where I sit, uh, in Washington and I care about the issue of what's happening in Gaza is that I, it, it seems sometimes just out of proportion to what else is happening, uh, around the globe. Um, there are, you know, 9 million displaced people in Sudan, you know, 6 million in Syria, uh, 4 million in Venezuela. And it's not to say that, that we shouldn't focus on Gaza, but, but the same question that you asked Debo about, you know, where is the African leaders, where are the African communities? You know, you could ask the same thing about some of these other uh, horrible situations and where the international community is not acting. So why, why is there this particular concern, you know, where it's Israel and Gaza? Um, the second point, that I would make is just to say, um, you know, as as I've written uh, with with a co-author several articles. Uh, clearly, I believe that uh, Palestine Palestinians should have uh, an independent state. Uh, should be able to express their political self determination in an independent state. Uh, I personally think, from a realist perspective and a utilitarian perspective, that the most uh, viable option at this point is for there to be two states, uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, but there are certainly arguments that have uh, been brought to the fore about different structures for uh, either two states or two states part of a federation, uh, et cetera. But I think if you're talking about eliminating Israel, then you're going to you know, basically lose uh, a good part of the uh, international community, certainly in the West, uh, but I think uh, elsewhere too. So I prefer to focus on what positively can be done as opposed to uh, trying to, you know, either rewrite history from 1948 on or 1917 on or wherever you want to start uh, and look at what can be done today to create a viable uh, way for, for Palestinians and Israelis to live in peace and dignity. Yeah, Larry, just before you go, I, I, of course, the two-state solution appeared to be the most reasonable in the circumstances, given the, the nature of global politics and the position of the Israeli state within that. And to go back to Larry, I mean, to, to uh, Stephen, uh, it was really a, the, the Western world more or less calling the shots that. But do you think, uh, Larry, that uh, the two-state solution is feasible now after what all has happened since October? When you think it's gone up in, smoke, in the smoke, um, not, not least because of Netanyahu's own position, but also the reaction of uh, Hamas, uh, reaction of Palestinians, and you did the, the, the outrage on the part of the international community, what has happened. And uh, do you think that this is a high-profile the the end of the occupation. Now, you made the comment there that occupation it might be synonymous with the annihilation, strong order, of the Israeli state of, of the Jewish state. But is it necessarily so? Uh, decolonization was uh, in a sense end of end of occupation, wasn't it? It didn't mean the end of the former colonizers. Uh, the the post-apartheid uh, dispensation was the end of uh, apartheid. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the end of uh, the white white society in South Africa. 
Don't you, don't you think we need to be more nuanced in our definition of the of the end, end of occupation? Then then seeing it as I hmm? So on this I mean, point, I, yeah. On, so on this point, I think you know we will differ. I mean, I I you know have a different view of the history and uh, the you know the establishment of the state of Israel. But but regardless of that, I do think that you know in looking forward. Um, to paraphrase uh, Churchill, um, the two-state solution is probably the worst solution, except for all the others. And um, you know, uh, I haven't heard a viable, you know, plan politically. You know, how realistically, how do you get um, Palestinians and Israelis at this point in time uh, to create anything other than you know two independent states? We can then talk about issues that have. You know, been the problem like uh, the territorial boundary. We can talk about uh, issues like Jerusalem, um, the economic relationships. Uh, but to me, uh, the, the two-state solution is the only realistic. If you're looking at this from a, a realistic perspective, or like I said, a utilitarian perspective, uh, the other solutions I fear are just going to create uh, more uh, violence, more tension, more conflict uh among the parties now again this is a bad part point point in time to raise these issues because obviously there is an ongoing conflict today um but i i don't see a way that you're gonna create uh you know one state uh i mean i just don't see it as practical and i think most palestinians uh you know are realistic enough to say that we, what we really want at this point is an independent state so yeah, what 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 is the position of the State Department right now uh, on on the true state solution? Uh, very state? much, uh, very much supported. Um, <coughs> the State Department is, you know, I mean, basically this has been the 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 view since uh, two thousand. Uh, President Bush at the time, you know, made a pronouncement uh, that his vision it was uh, two states, uh, Palestine and Israel, living side by side in peace. And that was continued through President Obama. I'm not going to re refer to President Trump's tenure because I think it was a little more ambiguous. But certainly, President Biden has been a strong advocate of uh, you know two states, and he's reiterated it uh, in you know in in the real time of uh, this particular conflict. And I think um, you know again how we get there is a big challenge. I, I no no one denies that. But but the 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 goal, the vision, uh, is certainly uh, there, and and like I said, some like myself are pushing for early recognition of a Palestinian state by the U.S., by the U.K., by other uh, Western countries, uh, as a way to give the Palestinians a sense that there is an end, you know, an end that we 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 do see where they would be uh, independent and have their dignity, and uh, others will say. No, we should wait till you know further along in the negotiations or at the end of the negotiations, and I think that's been a mistake uh, so far. Thanks, Larry, and sorry for ambushing you. But uh, you know, quite a bit. It's, it's something I think about. But I, like I said, I was most interested in hearing you know how folks who care about issues like human rights and uh, yeah. you know in Africa are are reacting to these issues. So thanks for uh, inviting me to join. I thank Tony. And uh, I look forward to listening. I'll, I'll be on for a couple more minutes. Yeah, Stephen, uh, uh, my question to, to Larry, to you now, uh, as your, you could make the, your concluding remarks, because I think it will be finished in 10 minutes. Um, so Stephen, the feasibility of a two-state two, two solution uh, and or, and or and the end of occupation. Um, what's your, and in particular, whether uh, and the end of occupation is synonymous with the end of the Israeli uh, question or the Jewish question, or the idea that this means annihilation of the Jews and in the same in Israel, in the, in the Middle East, in the same way that uh, supremacists in the South Africa argued that the end of apartheid would be the end of, of, of whites in South Africa. I just thought maybe we need to be more nuanced, but also 
you trying to explain as, as intellectuals what the end of occupation would really mean. For me, it, uh, of course, it means the liberation of both Palestinians and, and, and uh, uh, Israelis uh, and having one state in which uh, neither, neither, neither Jew nor Palestinian is bad or good, just citizens of one country. Stephen? Yeah, thanks, Eva. Well, I mean, that would be my aspiration too. Uh, just a couple of comments on this two-state issue. Um, the first one is that it seems to me, just as a starting point, to be entirely contradictory. I mean, I assume, because there doesn't seem to me to be an alternative, I assume that uh, Larry and others who take his view would agree that an end to this conflict should be negotiated. <clears throat> because presumably if you don't negotiate it, somebody is imposing an outcome on somebody else. Now, it seems to me to be quite contradictory to say, well, we favor people negotiating, but we're telling them at the outset what they have to negotiate. Uh, so you're taking a whole lot of options off the table because those aren't allowed. That doesn't strike me as a, as a particularly uh, consistent view on negotiation. Secondly, I think, you know, to use a buzzword, but I think that uh, this, this is important. I, you know, questions are, you know, the, the, the constant argument which is heard, which is that Jewish Israelis will never accept a uh, constant, etc. Precisely the same comment, claims were made repeatedly about white South Africans. It was repeatedly claimed by some very prominent academics whose names I could share that white South Africans would never tolerate what they've been tolerating for the last 30 years. And, and I think that part of the, you know, part of the problem here is that one is assuming when one starts, you know, I mean, you know, as a statement of what Jewish Israelis would accept today, I think, you know, we can agree that that's, that's accurate. But in a sense, the process hasn't even started yet, because whether you're in favor of one state or two states, uh, it does seem to me that nothing is going to change in this conflict unless there is significant pressure on the Israeli state to change. <clears throat> because any negotiation theorist and any conflict resolution theorist, I know that's Tony, one of Tony Rela's specialities, will tell you that unless there's pressure on both sides uh, to negotiate, uh, then there's going to be no negotiation. Uh, and that means that if that, if, 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 if that is a, a, a sine qua non of the entire process, I, I mean, who is to say what Jewish Israelis will accept in 10 years time uh, after a process of, of, of sanctions, after a process of cutting off arms supplies, et cetera, were that to happen? Uh, I can certainly tell you from my own country that white South Africans' attitudes change remarkably, not necessarily in their deep affection for black people, but in the pragmatic calculations they made. Uh, and, and, and we certainly need to be open to the possibility here. Uh, and then the final point, which I think that Ibo has been, been hinting at, but I think needs to be thrown back. You know, we are constantly told that the two-state solution is the realistic solution. But the people, first of all, the people who advocate this realistic solution, <clears throat> you know, as Larry has done, us, oh well, it's very difficult, and it'll take you know. What if it's if it's if it's if if it's that realistic, uh, you know, it's clearly not realistic now. Uh, and if you're saying that after all sorts of things happen, it might become realistic, uh, well, other options may become realistic in that process too. And, and I think one of the problems I have about the two-state arguments at the moment, besides those big picture issues which Ibo has been raising, which I endorse, is that people who support two states are. are are, are very inarticulate on what these states would look like. Where would they be? Where would this Palestinian state be? What would its borders be? <laughs> what what would its uh, you know what 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 would its sources of income be? Uh, right now, who is going to pay for the reconstruction of Gaza? I don't think these are trivial questions because I think that if you're portraying your solution as the realistic solution, as opposed to those you know, uh, airy-fairy types uh, like myself who have these, these idealistic notions of the future. Uh, a realistic solution presumably has very a lot of detail to it. Uh, and therefore, I'm not, I'm not 
making you know I'm not making this claim about Larry, but uh, and 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 others who you know who no doubt hold this position with goodwill. I think a lot of Western governments simply say two state solution because it's an excuse for doing nothing, because it then gets them off the hook and they can move on to do exactly what they're doing at the moment. While I've got the floor, I know you're closing up. I did want to uh, say I did want to respond to Tony's two points if I can have uh, a couple of minutes to do that. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. This, okay, just because it came up, I think, in Willie's response to well, this whole question of genocide against crimes and humanity, it's, it's, it's an important argument, and I've heard that this argument quite a lot of times before. Uh, there's just two kind of quite interesting factual dimensions to this, which I simply throw into the argument. Uh, the one is that the South African decision to emphasize genocide was actually a very specifically tactically legal de decision. Um, uh, it has to do with the statutes of the International Court of Justice and what was, the lawyers felt was necessary. Uh, and as you will know from the case, they used the fact that there was a dispute between South Africa and the Israeli state over how to interpret the Genocide Convention. Uh, and uh, maybe they were strategically wrong, but I, I did want to make the point that some strategic thinking did go into that. Uh, the second point, which is something which gets glossed over in this, the first people <laughs> to start using the word genocide and to start drawing attention to the word genocide and, and to be noticed uh, was, were, his, were, were, were a group of Holocaust and genocide scholars, most of whom happen to be Jewish Israelis. So <laughs> it's just a sort of interesting nuance that people like Russ Siegel and his colleagues, etc., were the ones who said, look, there's a genocide going on. Just a point about the Nakba and the way in which people reacted. Look, you know, my one of the things you need to understand if you want to understand the Israeli state from 1948 until today is a concept uh, called the Iron Wall. And in a nutshell, because we, we have limited time, uh, the Iron Wall was invented by a man called Jabotinsky, who was a, was a very right-wing Zionist, but adopted by uh, the more liberal Zionists. And Jabotinsky's argument was that Palestinians will never accept the Israeli state because it's taking their land away. And the only way in which Israelis, the Israeli state could be born and could maintain itself was by using so much violence against Palestinians that they would know that uh, resistance was useless uh, and, and therefore uh, they, 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 would, they would have to capitulate. And that has been a constant theme in Israeli state strategy from 1948 until today. The other point related to that, which really addresses Tony's question is, the, which also relates to the two states issue. The borders which the, 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 the Zionist movement accepted in 1948, which were the United Nations borders, were not at all the borders they wanted. They made it quite clear that they would use those borders in order to keep expanding until they got what they want, which ironically, given the debates uh, over a particular phrase at the moment, what they want was, has been articulated by Netanyahu and others, they want a Jewish state from the river to the sea. Uh, and, and, and that started with the Nakba, the first Nakba. It has continued to today. Uh, and so that if you want to understand the Israelis, uh, some of the actions of the Israeli state, uh, you have to understand that this has been a constant process of trying to use their power to take more and more land, to occupy more and more territory. Uh, and of course, that raises some very interesting questions about how a two-state approach would be able to reverse that. Thanks. I, I, you know, there's a lot more I could say, but let's move on. Thanks, Stephen. Now, thank you more formally towards the end. I'll now we'll call uh, Willie your last words, and in particular addressing the same issues as we've been discussing with Larry uh, Gaba and now with Stephen, who has really been poignant in his remarks and has, yeah, in my, has really informed us the circle yeah, context. I mean, Get on, you know, you know I, I, I support what you and Stephen have said. If, uh, we're going to uh, to mobilize the people of the world. I think the two issues, uh, you know, uh, they, have, they have to be integrated. 
And you have raised a very pers persuasive issue that is historic, you know, of South Africa, of Zimbabwe, of, of uh, Kenya as well. Um, and, and I think if we are going to, to urge the world to, uh, you know, to, to basically support changes in Palestine, uh, the two-state solution is, is off the table. That would be my my my, my view. That's it, Willie. Thanks, Willie. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Asante, Sana, and uh, really, uh, both uh, you and Steve have been very, very instructive. I learned a lot from your Stephen's outline. And uh, not least uh, his, his concluding remarks on the two-state solution vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, lifting the occupation. But all said, we are really just at the beginning of it. The irony is that what has been happening in Gaza, in Palestine, has raised the stakes likewise. And it intentionalized this issue. And we need, as intellectuals, uh, to to keep the advocacy going and also to uh, elucidate, elaborate on the points that uh, uh, that Stephen uh, made at the end. How do we get to look at the Palestinian question as a, as a colonial question as well, which requires the same kind of uh, solution, the better commerce, as that which visited the colonies. On that note, I want to thank everybody, uh, those of you firefield and those at home, um, and in particular, William Tunga and, and uh, Stephen Friedman. Likewise, Larry Wumui ambushed. Uh, thank you very much.